today's webinar, Responsible Animal Framework in Action. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion throughout the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Now on to Anna Heaton. Anna? Hi Rose, thanks very much for, for introducing uh, the Responsible Animal Fibres Standards in, in Action and thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, actually, I'm going to get my colleague uh, Hannah to kick us off and then I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Anna. So uh, my name is Hannah Dees. I'm Senior Manager of Standards here at Textile Exchange and with me I have the, the core team working on animal fibres in the organisation. So Anna Heaton a newly appointed senior manager for animal materials and Cali Weldon standards and alpaca specialist. Our focus today is very much on the implementation of the standard at the farm level and we are joined by some really fantastic guests and RWS pioneers. So um, with us we have Pedro Tegri from Lanas Trinidad, Bella Plankett Gillen from Fox and Lily, Willy Gaya from the Schneider Group, Jeannie Carver from Shanico Wool Company, Ricardo Fenton from Ovis 21, Chris Hobson from BKB, and Dave Maslin from New Zealand Marine. And uh, I also wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you all to, to the team working with the textile exchange standard system. As the adoption of our standards is growing, so is the team that are supporting the work and that you might come across when you send inquiries to the standards at mailbox. Uh, so it's just a, a, a quick introduction to uh, who's now working on, on the standards. As I mentioned, the focus today is on the adoption of the, of the standards, but we'll start with a, a quick a quick roundup of news and, and updates that are relevant if you're working with our standards. And then we look at the adoption of the RWS, the RMS and the release of the RAS. And we'd also have uh, an exciting update for you on the communal farmer certification pilots that we have been doing. And uh, then we will dive into the, the main focus of the webinar, which is the a panel discussion focused on land management and regenerative practices and outcomes. So I'll just get us started off with the, the news and uh, updates. So the Responsible Animal Fibres Standards is a bit of a new term that we're using as a collective name for the RWS, the RMS and the RAS. It's a family of voluntary global standards that address the welfare of sheep, angora goats and alpacas and the land that they graze on. The RWS was the, the first standard released and it's actually almost exactly five years ago that it was released in June 2016. The Responsible Mohair Standard came second and it was released last year in March 2020 alongside a revised version of the RWS. Around the same time, we initiated the development of the um, Responsible Alpaca Standard, uh, which was launched in April this year. The standards are aligned at the farm level and to do this we use an animal welfare framework to ensure that where the standards need to differ due to species specific needs we are still aligned at a principle or threshold level so that we're delivering consistently the same desired outcomes and uh, operating along the same principles. But then uh, where, where it differs is when the material goes into the supply chain, there we've made a fairly large change where we've combined the standards into, into one, which is the responsible animal fiber scope of the CCS. So this means that any supply chain sites that are certified to the CCS with an RAF, so responsible animal fiber scope, uh, they're eligible to process RWS, RMS and RAS material without the need for any additional um, audits. So this, this is something that is in place already and has been since the release of the RMS and for sites that are currently certified to the RWS, they can update their scope certificate and, and receive RAS and RAS material. And 
I will now pass on to Callie, who will give a bit of an update on some developments regarding claims. Thanks, Anna. Um, and let me know if my internet is not super stable. Um, I just had a little bit of a power outage, so hopefully it works. Um, so in regards to RAF claims, um, essentially once the certified material enters into the supply chain um, and you do have a full chain of custody for the finished good, um, we do have assured product specific claims that are available as an option for the finished good. Um, and this would be a scope specific claim. So you would be able to reference the actual standard that the material is coming from um, versus making a claim on the RAF. So um, if you do have full chain of custody and you are able to verify with um, a transaction certificate, then um, you can make a claim such as <clears throat> this product or this component contains X percentage of um, the responsible mohair, the responsible wool, or responsible alpaca standard certified grown material. Um, so we're just calling that out because it still follows our same chain of custody process, but you do make scope specific claims for verified goods at the end. And then we can go to the next slide. So we do also have some, um, we, so our standard system is a voluntary chain of custody system. You may have full chain of custody, but also sometimes um, we realize that there's supply chains that are in transition or there's the goal is not to label on product at the end for some companies. So um, they, there are options for using the logo and making claims while supply is still being being built, um, or if you don't have full chain of custody. And so we put together this helpful chart that just gives some options for what, what that could look like. Um, the first is general marketing claims or informational statements, which are pretty straightforward and how they sound. Um, there's no approval needed, and you can put them in a variety of places that general marketing claims would appear, as long as it doesn't insinuate that a specific good is actually certified. Um, and you can use the logo, um, and you can start doing this now. Um, the second is a commitment claim, which was launched with the new standards claim policy this past year. And so this is a claim that you can register with Textile Exchange. It doesn't go through a certification body. Um, and it essentially states that your organization or um, your brand is committed to source a certain percentage of the certified material by a certain time frame. Um, and this is a great tool while supply is being built and some of the newer standards, such as the alpaca standard. Um, and we also encourage it just for all brands and even supply chain members can, can fill out commitment registration forms. Um, <clears throat> it's a great tool while chain of custody is being built to be able to still talk about the standard. Um, and then the last is a custom-based agreement, which I'll go back to kind of how we could use this uh, later on in the presentation. But this is essentially if you have an agreement with Textile Exchange, then um, you can have custom language um, and, and make claims about certain aspects of that agreement that you have. Um, and there's some options that you can use for the communal funding um, that I'll talk about in, in a little bit here. And then I think we just have some examples on the next page of what a product specific claim would be, which is assured it would go on the hang tag with a license number um, from the certification body. And then a general marketing claim would be more of an, an ad or a catalog type image that doesn't have specific product information. Um, so for this slide, um, I just wanted to talk quickly about the brand sourcing guide that we're launching. So this, uh, we did have a responsible wool standard brand sourcing guide, and this will actually now turn into the responsible animal fiber brand sourcing guide, um, which is really exciting because it, it kind of fills this gap between um, certification information and then how to use the standards as a brand or a retailer to source certified material. So we talk a lot about um, animal welfare and kind of the pillars of the standards and how you can start to incorporate an animal welfare policy into your internal company's um, policies and alignment. And, and then we talk about how you would actually take that and use the different tools and standards that exist in the marketplace to, to achieve your goals. So I'm really excited about the launch of this document. Um, we are launching it today and the link will post in this um, in the slide in the follow-up content afterwards. Um, and you can also contact Responsible Wool for, for a copy if you're interested as well. Um, and lastly, for me, I just wanted to touch on some of the RAF upcoming engagements. Um, we've been working really hard on developing uh, 
more strategized um, content for the standards in, in terms of business development. And so what we've heard from our stakeholders is that um, there are certain hot topics or areas that could really we could lean into more for support. And so one of the things that we're putting together in August is a webinar um, that will be titling from fiber ban to yes, we can. And it's essentially going to be um, kind of a, a workshop and a webinar about how to successfully reintroduce or introduce responsible animal fibers into your portfolio, um, potentially after they haven't been part of your, your materials portfolio for a while or ever. And then we'll look at case studies from brands who have been through this process. What does verification look like at the brand level? Um, this webinar that we're having today is more focused on demand and uh, or sorry, supply. And so this webinar in August will be more focused on demand and how to you know, meaningfully engage with your suppliers, work with traders and agents on certified goods. And then we're hoping to directly after that webinar have a brand sourcing workshop, um, which will be really interesting. It'll be a time that brands can, can unmute and talk to each other about um, you know, how they've successfully done this or questions that they have. And then we're hoping to also put together a hub community for um, a little bit of mentorship in this space and, and start a, a specific niche community on the hub where people can talk in between calls. Um, we'll also be updating our PR guide for animal welfare, which will also be, re be released at the end of the summer. And then we're also working on a retailer guide for sourcing certified goods, which um, right now is, is together with the brand sourcing guide that we have, but we're gonna be breaking it out since um, there are specific areas that retailers have questions about in working with certified brands. So these are all really exciting upcoming areas of engagement. So stay tuned, um, stay tuned for that at the end of the summer. Lastly, uh, just with the content claim standard 3.0, we are trying to kind of plug this as much as possible because there are some shifts coming with our chain of custody standard. Um, so we are launching this standard on July 1st, so in a couple days here. It's been through a revision process for over a year now um, with over 100 stakeholders who participated in the international working group to help update and revise the requirements. And it's um, the backbone, as you know, to all of our all of our standards that we have for chain of custody. So. Some of the key changes to look out for, um, one of the major ones is that previously chain of custody ran through the last supplier in the B2B transaction, and now um, chain of custody will run through to the brand level. So if you would like to make product specific claims or your retailer or who you distribute to would like to make product specific claims, brand certification will be required to label um, by, July, by July 2nd of 2022. So We'll launch the standard on July 1st of this year, and then there's a year compliance deadline. So if your brand is at the stage where you are um, you know, making claims, but from your direct supplier's chain of custody, you should start looking at um, brand certification yourself. And, and we have a lot of resources coming with the launch of the standard that can help with that. Um, and then there's some other key changes down here, like traders who don't take physical possession will no longer require to be certified contracts required with all subcontractors. Um, and we do have a full list of changes that we're going to publish on the website. But if you have questions, get in contact with standards at textileexchange.org, um, but also uh, look out for the launch on um, the CCS website on July 1st. And I think I'm handing it back over to Hannah and Anna now. Yes, thank you very much, Callie. You think we've got a couple of uh, busy months coming up and there's a, a, a lot of, um, a lot of news, but a lot of exciting work in the in the pipeline to look forward to. I'll just uh, give a little bit of an update now on the um, on the adoption of the standards. So, as mentioned at the start, we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of the RWS, or perhaps the the celebration will wait until we can all get together again in person. Um, it's interesting now, a few years down the line, look, looking back to, to look at how far we've come. It was a fairly slow start because uh, we, we had a, a sort of a, a blank sheet of paper. We had to develop the assurance infrastructure. Uh, and I think a lot of the panelists that are with us today have, have really uh, been instrumental in, in, uh, in building up the system and getting the, the um, farm groups in place to put the standard in position it is now where uh, it, it has got the capacity to, to scale and, and grow much more quickly. And we are seeing the, the growth increasing. However, looking at the, the sort of the overall site count like this is not super helpful because uh, it's uh, one, one scope certificate is, is one site. So if it's a farm group, that could be um, a much larger number. So 
to, to get a true sense of the scale, it's helpful to drill down into the numbers of certified farms. Uh, so again, we can see this really strong growth trajectory. We left uh, uh, 20, 2016 off there, but we did have one, one farm in 2016, which was uh, uh, Genie's farm, but we've now grown to over 1500 farms by the end of uh, 2020. Uh, throughout South Africa has been the, the leading country for adoption of the, uh, of the RWS. Uh, but we've, we've seen this strong, consistent growth across all the, the key power wool producing countries. Um, farms come in, in different sizes, though. So again, to get another sort of perspective on the, the scale of the adoption of the standard, uh, and also remind us of why the, the purpose of doing this as well, the animal welfare, uh, it's helpful to look at um, how many sheep there are certified. So here we observe a similar trend to the, the farm growth trajectory. And we are, we are exploring different ways of how we best calculate market share, which data sets are, are the most useful. Uh, we are preparing some, uh, some reports on this for the upcoming preferred fibers and materials market report, which will be coming out next month. But as a sort of a preview on that, I think uh, some of the calculations are showing that the market share of RWS is now approximately 25% in South Africa and at about 11% in, in Uruguay, but this is very much uh, work in, in progress. The, um, the majority of, of sheep that are under certification are merino sheep. We see it's applicable across all, all breeds of sheep, but to date, most of the adoption has been um, uh, for, for merino sheep approximately 75%, but we're also seeing a, a, a growth in, in other uh, breeds as well as uh, a, a wider micron range reported as well. Um, and just here, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that Australia was well, the third, third largest producer in terms of the numbers of farms. It's the second largest producer this year now in terms of RWS certified wool. And we are seeing uh, a, a growth in the adoption of the RWS in, in Australia. And another, another note just to flag here is that these, uh, these charts here don't include uh, data from the US or New Zealand. But again, we will have a, a, a comprehensive report in the upcoming preferred fibers and materials market report. And last but not least on, on the performance reporting is uh, the land under certification. Uh, in 2020, there was over 12 million hectare of land under RWS certification that was used for sheep. South Africa, again, the leading country, but here we had Argentina in second place, followed by Australia and Uruguay. And for those that joined our webinar in, in December, I think we started talking then about our spatial data collection. And I'm very pleased to report that that project is now uh, completed and we're starting the, the rollout with certification bodies in, um, in July, then followed with rollout with the farm groups. So we're looking forward to having much more reporting on, on the land aspect of the, the standard. And Moving on to the responsible mohair standard, as I mentioned, it was released in March 2020. Despite the timing of the release of the standard aligning pretty uh, exactly with the world going into, into lockdown, we have seen phenomenal uh, adoption of the standard. And I think full credit for this goes to the, the farmers and the farm groups in South Africa, as well as the industry organizations that are, are making it happen. And I just included some pictures here to kind of show what why it's been so successful. And it's really this fantastic existing infrastructure that was already in place down in the, in the Bottom left-hand corner, you might recognize uh, Dr. Mackey um, providing a farmer, farmer training. He's the, the goat vet that's uh, freely available to mohair producers in South Africa. Um, and the other picture is um, an invitation for a workshop hosted by the Mohair Empowerment Trust and uh, just part of a sort of a really comprehensive program of, of producer support provided by 
uh, Mera South Africa and the Empowerment Trust. And uh, in, the, in the top right hand corner, you perhaps can't see, see very well, but I think it's a really good example as well of the role that the farm groups can play in terms of supporting producers with the, uh, the work that is required to become certified and meet the requirements of the standard. And uh, so it's just a, a snapshot of some of the, the paperwork and uh, practical support provided by a farm group to, to farm group members. Um, a lot of the certification to the RMS is combined certification with the RWS. So we're working on how to, to best kind of uh, report progress and, and track the information. But just they included a, a summary snapshot here of the, the picture from South Africa with uh, 1,315 farms that are certified to RWS and RMS. Uh, and that the standard now covers, despite uh, it only having been up and running for just over a year, almost half a million goats, which I think you, you'll agree with me, is a, a pretty impressive achievement. And I will now hand over to Kali, who will give you an update on the uh, responsible alpaca standard. Thanks. Um, I think this slide actually might be Anna, and then I'm going to touch on the supply updates and the implementation on the next slide. Yep, thanks, Callie. Yeah, sorry. So the tag team across these presentations. It was really just, uh, as Hannah mentioned, we've only just launched the uh, responsible al alpaca standard uh, and really just sort of reiterating that this is uh, following the same model, the same animal welfare framework as we have for the responsible wool and responsible mohair standard. So the key modules in terms of nutrition and living environment are, are all the same. Um, there's some things as we've developed this standard that we've found uh, that are challenges that are the same that we have in some regions for sheep and for goats. So things like the availability of pain relief, which is uh, very, very regional and tools for on farm slaughter and euthanasia. But also with alpaca, we've been working through the, the, those sort of species specific uh, requirements that we need to make sure we are covering in the standards. Uh, so things like uh, the shearing of alpacas, I mean, the principles of, of good handling and good shearing are the same, but with the alpacas, a, a much larger animal and the use of restraint for shearing, we have to make sure the standards had a framework that uh, ensured the welfare of the alpacas was still protected. Uh, we had to get into alpacas teeth, which uh, need to be may need to be rasped or trimmed. So that's something we haven't really had to deal with with sheep and goats uh, and the anatomy of alpacas is actually quite different so again although in all species we cover uh, the painful procedures like castration in alpacas this is a, a surgical operation so that's um, the, the op you know that's the only option whereas with sheep and goats there are other options and it's done at much older ages though as it happens it's actually quite rare that this this is done in Peru so it's really just to say we've um, yeah we've we've built the standard from that and made sure we've uh, included built, built the standard from the animal welfare framework but made sure we've included all those species specific requirements Great. And then I can just talk about kind of where the industry is at with the, the implementation plans. Um, the farmers, like other standards, while we were developing the requirements, um, were both part of the process, but also trying to align their internal organizations to, to be ready to start audits when the standard launched. Um, so we do have a couple farms that um, have applied for on-site audits this summer, which is really exciting. Um, and that will be um, you know, in preparation for the shearing season, which starts in November and runs through May of next year. So we will hopefully start to see fiber trickling in through that time frame. Um, again, just due to the nature and the landscape, um, physical landscape of the alpaca supply chain, um, it will be um, a process to get the supply up and running. Um, but we do have two implementation proposals for a five-year supply builds plan. And by the end of the five years, this will hopefully cover about 80% of farmers um, and quite a, a bit of fiber. So the Industry Association for Alpaca is um, forming a board of advisors and we are working with them on a funding mechanism where um, we can, textile exchange can essentially match funding to on the ground efforts for implementation to help speed up supply. And, and this fund will be managed by um, an external source that will help to um, kind of 
play bank for the for the funds that textile exchange can help facilitate in matching. Um, the um, RAF communal farmer communal farmer funding mechanism um, is is what this this is being built for. So um, communal farmers will be able to have access to this fund pool and be able to use it to um, run veterinary workshops or um, run radio ads about the standard or um, pilot different types of um, areas that there might be gaps in the requirements on their farm to be able to get certified um, more more quickly. Um, so like I said, the on-farm RAS certification can begin now. Um, the certification procedures are being released this month and then um, RAF supply chain certification can really happen anytime. Um, if you are a supply chain member that already had our WS or our MS scopes, then you've automatically been granted an alpaca scope as well. Um, and those scopes will be updated by the end of this year. So you should see that on your scope certificate um, by the end of 2021. And um, I'm going to uh, just do a brief uh, summary of the communal farmer pilot. Um, Hannah mentioned right at the beginning, this has been quite an exciting development for us. It's something that uh, we worked on alongside the responsible alpaca standards, um, but actually is something we knew there was a need for in other fibres as well. And it's really uh, being able to extend certification to um, small scale uh, communal farmers, uh, including nomadic and semi nomadic farmers across the different fibres in the uh, responsible um, animal fibres group. Uh, and uh, we actually there was pilot communal farmer group audits were carried out in India in, in March this year, which was uh, uh, control union and textile exchange representatives and we're very grateful because again obviously in a covid year that's tricky uh two groups of uh, nomadic semi-nomadic wool farmers were audited and and what this allowed us to do was to test the approach that we're using for communal farmers we're not changing the standards for communal farmers but what we're trying to do is be a bit innovative in how we audit and assess those farmers, as these tend to be people who do not have the uh, records and plans that more commercial farms may have. So it was looking at sort of uh, uh, developing some of the uh, planning and record keeping that's needed is done at the group level for the communal farmers rather than each individual farmer having to do this. And then for things like animal welfare, we're actually looking at um, outcome assessments for the animals for individual um, herders and farmers in, in the group, which is this animal welfare indicators or AWIN um, approach that, that we've been using. Um, and the, the pilot was uh, was very positive, some really useful feedback. It's 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 it did go uh, very well. Um, but it's just what we're what we're now sort of looking at is um, how we do the sampling for the animal welfare indicators, how many animals are sampled are in each individual herd or flock some clarity when we're talking about these communal groups, there's still the internal control system as there would be for, if you like, a, a normal in inverted commas farm group, but it's just having the clarity about who's taking responsibility for resolving any non-compliances, whether that's sitting with the uh, ICS or the individual farmers, and then the timelines for minor non-compliance uh, resolution for which we basically will allow uh, for minor non-compliance a slightly extended timeline just because of the difficulties in uh, communication and implementing uh, the, the, the new requirements. And this approach is being developed, well, as we say, across all the responsible animal fibre standards. So uh, this, is, this is something we will definitely also be using in Peru uh, for the responsible alpaca standards. As I say, we've piloted this in, in India for wool, uh, and we know we have um, both wool and mohair farmers in uh, South Africa and Lesotho uh, which will all, this could also be applicable to as well. Right. We really are tag teaming. Um, so with the uh, custom claims that I spoke about earlier, we do have an option for agreement-based claims. So with this communal farming model, um, as I mentioned, there's a, a need for implementation funding for 
not only the Response to Alpaca standard, but other communal programs that are following similar um, structures and have the same economic constraints when it comes to implementing a standard. So there is a funding need for this model and textile exchange is essentially acting as a financial matcher for these programs. And so if you're interested in this type of engagement, you can make custom agreement based claims on this with your supply chain before full chain of custody is in place. Um, we do have a pledge form now that I will include the link to in this PowerPoint. Um, if you're interested while the kind of logistics of the actual financing um, organization is being ironed out, we can have you fill out a pledge form and then we can start working on what the agreement-based claim would be for that. But I just wanted to plug that because we are looking for this brand retailer supply chain engagement to invest in the communal farm supply. Great, thank you. So um, now we're gonna move into sort of implementing the standards and, and moving uh, beyond that. And actually I think we go straight to the, so this is where we're going to get into our, our panel discussion. And as Hannah had um, already uh, introduced at the, the beginning, uh, you see we've got some, some great panelists here, here today. Uh, I do have to say that uh, Willie from Schneider Group, he is on the call. He's unfortunately not actually able to speak. I am going to present a little bit about Schneider Group, but he is available. If there's any questions, particularly about anything that's presented, he is here and we can do that through the, um, through the q and if, if you do have anything uh, particular. And I also particularly wanted to shout out to Dave and Bella who are in Australia and New Zealand and therefore it is the middle of the night so we're very appreciative that uh, that they're joining us as well. Uh, to start this off what what I uh, what we asked all our panelists to do was to provide us a little bit of background information we asked everybody the same four questions so that I'm actually going to run through for for each of our panelists uh, a very sort of brief background piece of information uh, and I'm, I'm actually because we are quite Quite tight for time. I'm going to keep it fairly short so that we can get into letting them talk for themselves as, as soon as possible. As Rose said at the beginning of this uh, webinar, a copy of this will be sent to you. So you will have access to these slides because you'll see there is a bit more information on these slides than I am actually going to present, uh, present right now. But I say I'm keen to give everybody a chance to, to talk. So um, Hannah, if we can uh, move on. And I would say this is, this is in no no particular order, but um, I'll start with a, a big, brief sort of background to uh, Lanis Trinidad, and we're going to have uh, Pedro uh, speaking uh, shortly. Uh, and so this is Wool from Uruguay who are uh, working with uh, directly with farmer groups, buying greasy wool from farmers, sort, scour, combing it and um, exporting uh, combed wool tops. Uh, they hold uh, a responsible wool standard and uh, the GOTS, the organic uh, textile standard as, as well. Um, and they're looking at regenerative land management as a, as a new challenge on top of previous certifications. Uh, and this is recognition that the commitment is to deliver to future generations a better environment than the one they inherited and this point that this is all about continuous improvement when we start talking about regenerative which is going to be something you'll see comes up a, comes up a lot and if we go to the next slide uh, and at the moment I think it's fair to say that uh, Lanas Trinidad are, are starting their their journey of, of regenerative working regeneratively with their farmer group so the sort of it's this this key this word that's a, a real buzzword that comes up a lot but but what do we actually mean by regenerative what are people expecting if we start talking about regenerative fibers uh, and the point one of the points that Pedro made was that sometimes people might think about regenerative is only applicable if if a system's gone terribly wrong and we need to regenerate it, whereas the situation in, in Uruguay is um, quite positive in terms of rainfall, the weather, the natural pastures, uh, the environment being good for the people, but also for the, the sheep and, the, and any other grazing animals. And this whole thought that, you know, this is these are people who are farming in um, uh, in in harmony if you like with with the the, the natural sur surroundings and and wanting to promote the health of the land and their animals uh, but to move forward it's it's an understanding that if the if they go into producing regenerative wool then this is a this is a premium product so would need a, a premium price and also an understanding i mean really coming back to this 
how are we defining regenerative and that a definition, uh, some people's definition may not apply necessarily in all regions or may not apply to all situations because obviously there's regenerative food as well as regenerative fibre and, and a lot of other regenerative terms as well. So, uh, and then if I can go on again to Obus 21, then uh, we have Ricardo from Obus 21 with us. There's farms in two groups um, in Patagonia region of Argentina. Now, Ovis 21 uh, are very far advanced in their um, working with farmers in a, in a regenerative way. Uh, Ovis 21 is promoting regenerative livestock farming, producing an increase in ecosystem function, resulting in more biodiversity, better infiltration rates, really sort of soil qualities, uh, better quality and quantity of rations for, for livestock. And and Ovis 21 is using the ecological outcome verification tool, which is uh, part of the Savory Institute tool, and are helping farmers to work to, um, to, 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 to implement that. We can go to the next one. Uh, and there's five strategies, and again, I'm sure Ricardo will be able to talk more to this when we when we get to get to him. Uh, the, the sort of the school of regeneration, so um, courses from introductory through to specialisation in regenerative management. Uh, this sort of plus are this proposal for farmers and land managers to begin regenerative management, helping them plan, helping them set up the short and long term monitoring and and complying with the ecological outcome verification. And Utah, how this uses extension services, universities, researchers, and policymakers to sort of shift the paradigm in, in those areas. Um, uh, Ricardo's comment was to collaborate with all types of regenerative approaches uh, and collaborate with them with the context of outcomes, not practices. And I'll definitely ask Ricardo to talk more about that in, in a minute. Uh, I love this point here about we learn from each other to keep doing it better, not argue about which is best. Uh, and then uh, as the final point of how they're working with these, uh, having these regenerative animal welfare field days and workshops, showing real results and testimonials of farmers to farm organizations, uh, provincial entities and other people who apply them. And I think this peer-to-peer -peer learning again is something that's very important as we move into regenerative and we move on to our next group um oh sorry fine oh, sorry go back one sorry hannah we've still got the um what what does uh, what's needed to help deliver all these outcomes from over 21 uh again this this point about regenerative claims and sourcing needing to be outcome based and the term regenerative needs to be protected um, the regeneration is, is much more than carbon sequestration uh, and it can be measured. And again, you know, these, these, the claims and sourcing need to be from outcome based procedures. Um, brands need, if brands want to support regenerative production, then they need to source from regenerative uh, producers and, and really understanding what you're trying to deliver here the sort of uh, reducing the carbon or neutralizing the carbon footprint, uh, water and biodiversity footprints from, from the regions where you're sourcing and that's providing the the biggest impact and then the next um, is BKB uh, and BKB currently manage 65% share of South Africa wool and 75% share of South Africa mohair uh, and there again this is another group that's at the beginning of a formal regenerative strategy but but no BKB know that many farmers are well down the line in regenerative farming systems and actually Chris who is uh, director of BKB and is going to speak today is a farmer in his own right and implementing some of these uh, regenerative techniques um, and it, a lot of this is again this point that there may be farmers doing regenerative strategies on some farms but they're not sort of formally measuring it they're not looking necessarily at at the outcomes or the monitoring and measurement that that comes with that um, so what BKB are, are, are looking to do is really sort of uh, better understand how this is how this is going to work and introduce a program to help uh, the farmers understand what they what they need to do and the outcomes that are that are coming from that and if I have the next slide, and I think this has just got some examples here from Chris's farm, um, again, which is the kind of things that could be looked at um, for, for other farms, the sort of grazing management, 
uh, looking at the, the vegetation and reclaiming areas with alien vegetation, reclaiming eroded areas, so sort of resting, allowing areas to recovery, changing paddock boundaries to improve utilisation and prevent overgrazing, and then back to water again uh, as a very important uh, factor in, in livestock farming, but uh, improving and adding water articulation systems and having additional land with different rainfall patterns. And again, the support, it's really recognising that the financial outlay to, to really get the impact is, is substantial, especially in the first year or two when, when there's a lot to sort of get the farmers uh, are starting that regenerative journey and doing the baseline assessments and, and infrastructure. So support is, is definitely needed to, to, to help uh, move, move this on through the group. Uh, and then our next group is uh, Schneider. Uh, Schneider Group as a 100 year old family business based in Italy, but uh, with processing facilities uh, around the world and, and a wide range of, of, of fibres. I mean, I've just put in the header the, the wool from Australia, New Zealand and Argentina, but also looking at uh, cashmere, vicunia, uh, other fi uh, animal fibres um, from, from the source all the way through to, to spinning and weaving. And Schneider in 2019 produced uh, carbon neutral wool tops that were certified responsible wool standard and uh, organic global organic textile standard as well so it's the, the, the first in in the world uh, and what is Schneider group trying to deliver it's this sort of this concept of regenerative really uh, again this comment that a lot of growers have got an interest to this and that growers some growers are already using these techniques but weren't necessarily calling it regenerative or putting it into a formal framework and uh, the, the comment from Willie was that the concern was to ensure they promote practices that are applicable to all all. And again, this point about measurements, how, how are we measuring the, the outcomes, uh, the recommendations to achieve the outcomes and the science behind them, uh, and having sort of credible KPIs that can deliver on uh, science-based target initiative results and be transformed into solid claims for, for brands. And it, again, this point about this is, a, but, you know, regenerative is a real buzzword. Um, and, it, you know, the concept may only be achievable by a small percent of producers worldwide. And, and this, it, we must and, you know, I think the point Willie was trying to make is don't want to lose sight of, of other issues uh, like uh, fighting desertification uh, as, a, as a main uh, challenge as well. It's not to say that the two things can't sort of work together, but again, just sort of uh, focusing on land management and creating awareness through Schneider's Wool Connect programme are their, their main priorities. Uh, and again, through this online platform, we'll connect. It's really sort of connecting everybody in the supply chain here. So it's sort of uh, from the brokers and scientists and looking at carbon accounting and ongoing initiatives with Landcare Australia to map their Authentico, the Schneider programme Authentico, their growers in Australia, and to incorporate metrics again. So we're back to sort of measuring, uh, but create a cost effective and accessible system that everybody along the supply chain can use. Uh, I thought this was a, you know, a good point here. Uh, Schneider as processors themselves really understand how sensitive pricing is uh, and what, you know, they're just sort of having that in the back of the mind uh, all the time. Um, so again, the support needed, identifying a system that's universal, easy to apply and robust enough to provide the assurances and metrics that are needed, uh, supporting the wool platform will connect platform to educate growers worldwide uh, to to talk to growers but also understand their challenges and um, uh, this comment here that uh, wool is only one percent of textiles being used you know let's try and progress this uh, for a better for a better future uh, free of microplastics ensuring carbon sequestration reducing poverty and with the enhancement of biodiversity and this this great comment as the things that we could all achieve together if we partner is 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 beyond our wild streams and then we move on to New Zealand Merino uh, so New Zealand Merino oh sorry <laughs> yes no I have done that sorry New Zealand Merino if I can go on one Hannah uh, extensive gr a group of uh, farmers in New Zealand Australia and South Africa and New Zealand Merino have the regenerative agriculture platform uh, ZQRX which has 250 growers on 1.5 million hectares of land uh, and this is this is growing rapidly this is uh, something that um, has been introduced by New Zealand Merino and, and more and more growers are getting uh, interested in and the key outcomes increasing the capacity of soils to sequester carbon hold water 
alter and improve other elements of soil functionality, protecting, restoring and enhancing biodiversity, increasing CO2 removal. So again, we're sort of reducing the, the carbon um, footprint, but looking at this specifically with tree planting uh, as, as well as a method and also including animal welfare and social community well-being. And again, I think this, this, this comment about this is tied with people and land and animals is, is something that's come up as well. And then the next slide, please, um, for working. So working with the group through the ZQRX platform, looking at these sort of specific on-farm measurement, verification and certification, uh, scalable solutions offered to growers, including sort of training support and incentivizing change through improved economic outcomes for the farm and pricing sustainability and stability. So the support here is you know, the method methodological challenges. How, how do we account for CO2 on farm consistency and uh, the partnership, uh, you know, and brands to help incentivize the change uh, and actually uh, um, connecting brands directly to, to, to growers. Uh, and then I think hopefully Fox and Lily, uh, Australian with a farm group, Genesis. And again, Fox and Lily, I think fair to say at the beginning of the regenerative uh, process um, and wanting to enhance the work with Genesis, recognize again, efforts existing within the group by wool growers. Again, this, this comment that we've got people who have been doing this for a long time, it's just not necessarily within the group and looking at healthy soil and water, maintaining and improving biodiversity on farm. And uh, next slide. And then rather than reinventing the wheel, working with local Australian land groups who, who already have these decades of experience and promoting best practice. This point again, this is long term commitment and dedication. There can be a cost to it. And so what's needed is an understanding that switching to regenerative production can't happen overnight and we need support for the producers that are doing this. And then I think hopefully lastly, sorry, this is all these things take longer than you think. Uh, Jeannie and Shaniko Wool Company, Wool from the US. Um, so this is uh, headquartered in central Oregon, seven member ranches, 1.5 million acres or 600,000 hectares and really just talking about a range of different uh, you know this is this is from the slopes of the rocky mountains um to the sierra cascade mountains and the elevate lower elevation lands uh, between the sort of key regenerative outcomes improving vegetation cover producing the most nutrient rich so there's a quality uh, foliage with best soil health results uh, with water conservation and utilization and again highest quality of life to the sheep and all animals that live and graze the lands and play a vital role in their health and the last bit working with the group so uh, Jeannie made the comment that uh, again there's uh, as has come up with with Schneider and I'm sure other groups as well there are a lot of other experts and and agencies in the field that they're aligning with for the monitoring summarizing uh, prescribing grazing strategies and, and the training for for the farmers uh, but also uh, Shaniko have been uh, starting to measure impacts in terms of net carbon budgets and carbon sequestration to, to show the positive ecosystem impacts that they provide, taking soil and biomass measures on 1.5 million acres in the Western US under the guidance of their science team. So again, this is really delivering data here. And then the last one, um, I'll go to my last slide. It, this is this is really sort of putting it's it's really this comment about having credible data be behind the impacts and that people want to be able to make verifiable claims about the climate impacts of their company's carbon footprint and the fibers they source and this sort of investment in helping to deliver that can can help everybody in the supply chain so whoo that was a real whistle stop so let's actually hear from from some of these people so actually i'm going to circle back ricardo if you don't mind um if you could sort of kick us off with uh, a few comments about your program and the farmers and, and how you're you're working with them and any particular challenges that would be great. Well, good day everybody thanks uh, uh, Anna. Uh, well uh, a, a bit as you as you summarized in those uh, slides uh, uh, we started with uh, regenerative practices with uh, a very um, a, a clear defensiveness and uh, a lot of extension services, universities uh, and other farmers clearly against it uh, uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, that has been slowly, uh, slowly shifting. So uh, the initiatives that we've put in, in place 
uh, in a response to that um, learning curve. And uh, the more um, uh, uh, technicians that we have on board uh, learning, on the job learning, <laughs> it, it gives a great help. And obviously on the other side, we've had uh, uh, very good support from brands and other organizations that have accompanied this uh, learning curve. Uh, so basically uh, uh, for brands, for farmers, for the general public, it's so important to know the four ecosystem functions, know how that works, know how life uh, it works and with that it makes all regenerative uh, 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 startups or uh, planting the seed in farmers, in brands, uh, in universities and some of these establishments that are a bit harder to, uh, to move and bring new ideas to. Uh, with that as a, as a base you can start, um, you can start working. And the measurement uh, EOV is what we at the moment think is the best quality of information uh, for the farmer and uh, scientifically. Uh, and it's a very good balance of not being too expensive, uh, but giving great uh, information uh, on ecosystem function, biodiversity, uh, water and uh, carbon as uh, last but not least. Uh, so it's a good, um, uh, um, a good balance between all, all those things. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. Yeah, that's uh, it's really sort of a great sort of, again, tying that together. And as you say, the sort of understanding of the sort of ecosystem services, again, is just sort of really key to thinking about these sort of regenerative um, regenerative um, outcomes. Um, Dave, um, I wonder if you could just talk a bit more about the um, ZQ um, RX uh, platform. Thanks, Anna, and uh, and hi everyone. Um, I guess the ZQRX platform is something that we've been working on for about three years. Um, people have been talking about regenerative agriculture for quite a long time, as as we were just talking about a moment ago. And and for us, trying to understand what does that actually mean in the New Zealand context on the farming systems that we have, and we've got a really diverse range of landscapes and uh, and climate and and ecosystems here in New Zealand that we're trying to manage, and the same same as same as in, in other countries as well. So about three years ago, we went on this pathway of trying to understand what it would mean in the New Zealand context. Um, we'd already been running um, our ZQ1 farm accreditation program um, since about 2006 or 2007. So our growers were coming from a very strong base. For us, um, the concept of regenerative is, is about a mindset. Um, it's about a, a, an approach by farmers that um, won't settle for status quo. They want to leave their farms in a better place than what it was when they found it. And I'm yet to meet a farmer anywhere in the world that doesn't hold that really closely and deeply um, to, to themselves as, a, as, a, um, as an objective. I guess what was lacking in that statement was, well, if you want to leave the place better than it was when you found it, how are you going to know whether you're succeeding or not? And so what ZQRX is all about doing is providing our growers with a really credible framework by which they can monitor the cadence of change against um, a set of 15 key performance indicators that, that include all of the things we've talked about already around um, ecological health, soil health, um, climate impact, um, soil, uh, sorry, carbon sequestration and so forth, but also recognizing the deep integration of, of these ecosystems. They're, they're extraordinarily complex. And so decoupling um, come some of the core parameters of animal welfare and so forth, um, or social responsibility from this principle of, of regenerative agriculture, we think is a real mistake. So we've incorporated that as well. Uh, we launched ZQRX um, a few, uh, with growers about 12 months ago. So uh, we've, we've spent, uh, spent 12 months um, bringing growers on board the program, um, recognizing where they're at and building strategies for them to move forward. Um, and we're actively rolling that out across our, across our broader network of growers as we, as we speak. I, I guess to the point on the slide, and, and I guess to provoke some conversation too, one of the big challenges we've got is around how do we, across the wool um, and animal fibres supply base, get real consistency around the language that we use and the science, <clears throat> uh, the, the methodologies that we apply to account for things. So for example, um, applying um, uh, net greenhouse gas emission values rather than gross greenhouse gas emission values. 
So what I'm saying there is let's account for the emissions that an animal um, produces uh, in, during their life cycle, but let's also account for the amount of carbon that's being stored in soil and in plants um, as part of that management system, as part of that life cycle. There's no really globally recognized methodology that agrees um, that, that can be applied to that at the moment. So those are areas that we're working on really closely with our colleagues in Australia, um, with some great work that the International Textile Organization is doing um, and various others. So um, I'll, I'll stop talking now, Anna, because I know there's others that, that, that probably have lots to say as well, but happy to, happy to take questions and so forth. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And, and this thing, yeah, this sort of consistency and, and what are we measuring and, and can we agree on that? I think that is a it's a it's a really important point. But because um, you were sort of talking about carbon, uh, Jeannie, uh, are you able to unmute and just talk a little bit more about your um, your carbon monitoring uh, program? Yes, thank you. Um, it's just great listening to updates from everyone. So hello to my fellow wool people around the world. Um, yeah, I guess I guess what I would say is I really see a clarity, a, di a difference, a clear difference between um, meeting the standard and being certified, which which we are, and truly measuring and certifying the actual impacts of the way we operate. I think in agriculture in general, we tend to be, I'll say it this way, at the bottom of the economic chain, if you will. Um, and yet we hold such, such capability of making a huge difference. Um, I, I've been saying for a long time, and it took me decades to come to this recognition that the greatest harvest we deliver in agriculture, we don't sell. If you think about that, food, clothing, and shelter are the obvious harvests that we bring to humankind. And in the process, we're stewarding natural resources and all animals in the ecosystem by improving, obviously caring for the habitat. And, and the greatest service we provide is really to the whole ecosystem. And so um, a number of things led up to this, but it was January of 2020 that I decided just what Dave said about, and Ricardo touched on this, if we really are leaving it better for future generations, then we have to measure it. And it is complex and it is challenging and it is expensive. But to really have credible data, to have enough monitoring points on an ongoing basis and that are not only the right number, but where they are cited in order to bring credible data has been a real process for me. So I am not keeping the schedule I hoped I would, and yet I'm pressing on. I am so committed to this. It is expensive, but we will roll out all our measurements on the full million and a half acres in 2021. And so it's a very aggressive measurement program. It is taking an investment, but I believe it's some of the most important work we'll do. Dave just alluded to the fact that globally, if you look for models, true models with enough scientific data to be able to draw conclusions about grazing management practices and true ecosystem impacts. It's the, the models that we have, which come out of uh, global environmental efforts. Um, the computer models have been developed and they have the data to give us credible um, determinations on cropping and farming practices. But there is a lack of, of uh, enough data and quality data on grazing to really give us those same parallels. And so we are almost exclusively grazers in our many million and a half acres. And so this data, I believe, will become very, very important to helping tweak the current computer models so that those of us that are primarily livestock grazing will be able to have um, a better tool for determining our net carbon budget, which to me is the most significant thing we can do. Our actual footprint at the ranch level for each operation, and then our aggregate footprint, um, carbon footprint. And in that process, we'll be able to, as a result, 
know how many tons of carbon we're truly banking. And my plan is to, is to continue this forward and then have the same kind of third party verification that we have on the standard, on the model, on the data, on the analysis of the data and the summary results. Jeannie, I'm going to have to stop you there, but thank you very much. That's uh, that's that's really, again, just sort of really building on what's gone before. Um, Bella, do you want to say a bit about what Fox and Lily? I think you're at a slightly different stage of the of the process, but um, if yeah, if you'd like to say a few words. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks, Anna, and hello, everyone. Um, so similar to a lot of people, but we're been working on this in the background for a while now, but. Pretty, pretty early on, um, we're really approaching this space quite cautiously because we're really conscious of delivering real and measurable outcomes to our both our growers and to our end users. Um, the idea is that, I mean, regenerative agriculture in this process, it really is a change of mindset. It's a long-term commitment and you don't necessarily see outcomes and um, increased productivity straight away. So we really want to make sure that we, as it, like we have a duty of care to our growers to make sure that we're pr providing them with a framework that really works. Um, so yeah, I've been consulting with a lot of people in our industry, doing quite a few things in the background. Um, yeah, before we look at driving this forward. Great, thanks, Bella, and um, and Pedro as well. If if you'd like to talk about what you're you're doing with uh, Lanas Trinidad. Trinidad. Hi, good morning, every, everybody. Uh, I, I should say, Hannah, that uh, if we pay an overall look on the textiles consumption, wool is a 1% share in the, in, the, in the cake. Then you have uh, fibers coming from cellulosic. It means forestry, about 7%. Cotton is around 21%. And synthetics, which is a big headache, is more than 70% of the, of the share. So to, to work with wool first, uh, you have to love it. If you don't love the wool, if, if you don't appreciate the farmer's life, if you don't know what they do, uh, you shouldn't work wool. Uh, wool is an exquisite fiber and I should say that for a farmer, uh, the, the land and the sheep is, is not only uh, an asset for the family, it's the way, way of living. So first of all, I should say that in most of the cases, perhaps 99% at least, a farmer is serious about the management of the farm in terms of animal welfare and also in terms of land management, because it's the asset. If, if they burn the land, no future. Yeah. So secondly, uh, and it is nowadays of top importance, is the regenerative chapter. It came after many others, uh, like uh, animal welfare, and on the, on the mill side, all the ISO uh, certifications, and the corporate social responsibility and the circularity. So now it comes the turn of regenerative. And we think that is first we should uh, find, at least in the case of, of our country, a proper definition for regenerative. Because uh, if you pay a look to the, to the map around the world, you will find very, very different situations in respect of the, the, the weather conditions uh, and how are the possibilities for the different farmers to run their, their units. So we, we are working with the academy and the research institute here in Uruguay, trying to, to consider what is going on in other countries and to see the best we can pick for the, for the, uh, for, for the let's say the, the book in, in Uruguay, what should be what should be proposed to the from the farmers to the to the trade around the, the world. 
as I said before, uh, for the farmers is is their way of living. So uh, I I I think always in as in every activity we we can improve and we have to improve. But really, uh, a gul is a natural fiber, uh, totally uh, renewable, no, not contaminating. And sometimes we, we feel that some uh, big names are uh, indicating the farmers what they should do or they, what they should not do. And at the same time, uh, they have a big operation in, in some places where uh, they talk about recycle and recycle is a very, very limited volume. Uh, they talk about, uh, uh, I mean, qualities and, and uh, behavior and they are producing in, in very, let's say, uh, low cost countries. So I think that is, is a good time to, to put all the different aspects on top of the table and to find something good for the humanity. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pedro. That was great. And then last but definitely not least, uh, Chris uh, from BKB. Uh, and I know you're a farmer yourself and you're already sort of uh, using some of these regenerative uh, techniques. And it'd just be really useful to see how you see that uh, being potentially coming through the BKB group, how that can be expanded to the BKB group. Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, the exciting part for us, and I'm, as you as you correctly said, I wear two hats. So I'm, I'm a, far, a full time farmer, and I sit on the board of BKB. But the exciting thing from a BKB perspective is that, as you've seen from the stats, we have 65% of the South African wool market and 75% of the Maui market. So we're in a very good position to now. Now that we have a um, a sustainable system in place, we're in a we're in a very good position now to hold hands with our producers and walk them through rege regenerative farming practices. Um, we, we, we know our farmers intimately, and a lot of them are already a long way down the road with, 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 with various regenerative practices, um, reclaiming of, alien, of areas that are infested by alien vegetation, reclaiming areas that have been eroded, um, fencing off areas in order to improve the the, 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 the nutritional value of, 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 of the grazing, uh, moving water reticulation systems to points where you'll attract animals to an area that they would, would now make use of better, the grazing had there not been water there. And the other thing is a lot of South African, a lot of our South African breed producers also have a lot of game on their properties. And this is to get these guys to recognize that they need to take the, the, the load, the, the animal load into account when they calculate the, um, the, the carrying capacities, because if you don't take that into account, it has a profound impact on your, on your, on your grazing management plans. But from a BKB perspective, we, we, we're in a really good position to hold hands and, and in the next couple of weeks, we will we'll have a strategy in place on how we're gonna roll out a regenerative strategy for our producers. And then with our, 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 our extensive team of of field officers obviously hold our producers hands through implementing some of these strategies and documenting some of the strategies that a lot of our producers already have in place. Perfect. Thank you very much, Chris. And I appreciate those of you that stayed on the call. I know we're, we're overrunning uh, somewhat. And I think if one thing this has taught us is we, we could do a whole call just, just listening to these guys and, and learning from this experience. I mean, one thing I do want to point out is that uh, any of you that were on the uh, Responsible Animal Fibres round table will know that we, we do want to have this sort of uh, working group on, on regenerative. And, and really, uh, you know, some of that will be looking at things like uh, the, the method methodology issues and, and having sort of alignments uh, there. And I also just, Ray, just want to touch on the fact that uh, textile um, exchange is uh, looking at a sort of regenerative landscape uh, analysis uh, piece of work, which is it, again to intended to provide 
uh, the fashion and textile industry with a clear understanding of all the sort of tools, the programs, the inif initiatives, the guidance, the best practice, just a really sort of a trying to sort of grasp what's out there in the uh, regenerative agriculture landscape. And that, that's going to be worked on in, in textile exchange as well over, over the rest of this year. So there's, there's, there's things definitely coming on this. This is not going to be the last time that we're going to talk about this. And I, I hope this little uh, snapshot um, from the, the different groups has, has, has given you a better understanding of, of where people are and, and the different um, challenges that there, that, 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 that there can be, but also the great things that are already happening on the ground with, uh, with, with farmers. So uh, thank you all very much uh, for, for joining us and thank you especially to our, our panellists for, for speaking. I only wish I could have given you at least twice the time, but uh, thank you all very much. speakers. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, an email will be sent to all registered participants with a link to today's presentation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>